Well, we're nearly 25 years on now from the birth of the Barcelona process. It's still there, it still exists. Um, there are still meetings, there are still funds going into the partnership. There's still a lot of work, uh, very good work and necessary work being done, many projects, uh, many meetings and summits being held. But it's quite clear that the, the more ambitious um, aims of that partnership haven't been met. Uh, the process is still there, but it's changed shape. It's morphed into something else over the years and it's changed from being um, uh, a scheme aimed at very deep integration between e um, EU states and uh, southern Mediterranean states into being an initiative concerned more with kind of ad hoc uh, selective forms of cooperation. Many people would say um, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that the process has become a little bit more modest in its aims and that it's had to evolve to adapt to a very different uh, geopolitical situation. But it's clear there are big challenges both in the EU and uh, the Middle Eastern region, both these regions are suffering from a certain kind of fragmentation and internal tensions. So one could say the process is actually even more necessary than it's ever been before, even though it struggles to keep going and advance on its more political objectives. In the beginning, it was a very kind of pan-regional philosophy to relations between Europe and, and the Arab world. Um, that didn't really work. There are some, still some regional elements that um, are in existence and, and retain some momentum. But you're right, the focus has shifted to be placed on more bilateral uh, relations. And again, some people would say that was necessary, that you could never really apply the same approach to such a diverse uh, region. And that in order to meet the expectations and concerns of individual uh, partners in the southern Mediterranean, the EU had to um, uh, kind of change and modify its approach in accordance with each uh, individual country. It, to some extent, I think that's true. Uh, this more bilateral approach has enabled the EU to target specific priorities in, in the region in, in, a, in, a, in a much more um, specific way. But I think to completely lose the regional dynamics um, could become a, a weakness uh, in the future. The first lesson is what European leaders themselves acknowledged in 2011, that which was that for many years the EU had equated uh, stability with the status quo and had rather neglected the importance of underlying social changes across the, the Middle East and hadn't factored those into European uh, policies. So that's a lesson that needs to be kept on the agenda. I think arguably it's one the EU is in danger of forgetting once again as it shifts back to a greater concern with stability, which is completely justifiable and understandable. But the rather complicated question is actually what provides for stability in, in the longer term. You're right that the EU in the beginning was criticised for being a little bit slow in its reaction, but it did react. And I think to the EU's credit, it did a lot of very good things and necessary things in response to the Arab Spring. Released a lot of money, started to pressure for additional reforms, talked to a, a wider range of uh, social and civic actors in the southern Mediterranean. The problem was that when regimes themselves began to push back against democratic movements and dig their heels in to consolidate their own power, then arguably the, the EU didn't really follow through with the momentum that it had established and arguably gave up perhaps a little bit too easily um, on the Arab Spring. N not that the reversals to the Arab Spring were the fault of the European Union, um, but arguably it, it, it didn't consolidate on the potential for trying to help change that the EU had built up over the years. Yes, I don't think there's that much left of the EU's so-called democracy agenda in the Middle East it, or in the, the southern Mediterranean. It's not completely absent. The EU still spends, and some member states still spend, sizable amounts of money supporting civil society organisations and human rights objectives. So it hasn't disappeared from the agenda completely, but it's clearly been supplanted by other objectives.
uh, containing migration, um, counter radicalization, uh, other security issues. And of course, rhetorically, the EU does argue that it, it recognizes that achieving those kind of security aims requires a focus on human rights and underlying political and economic change. This is a very, very old story and the EU has been repeating this, this narrative for many, many years. The difficulty is actually implementing that in practice. And I, I, would, I would agree that the EU has become increasingly cautious in the degree to which it implements that in practice. That's not all the EU's fault. The fact that political and security conditions in the southern Mediterranean itself have evolved in a way that, that makes these, these kinds of aims so difficult to achieve uh, means that to some extent it's understandable that the EU has taken a slightly different approach from the one it mapped out uh, two decades ago. Of course, as we speak, the EU is hosting a, a very important conference in, in Brussels and has played a, a very significant and a positive role in mobilising um, more international funds to help Syria, mainly on humanitarian objectives. So I think the EU uh, deserves a lot of praise for keeping these uh, humanitarian objectives on the agenda. It claims it's mobilised something like 17, 18 billion euros uh, for Syrians hit by the crisis since the conflict started. So I think all that is good. Um, the EU and some member states have also um, undertaken some quite important um, work inside Syria, even as the conflict has got worse. Um, they've been doing some interesting uh, projects on trying to support opposition forces in the areas that they one from the regime. However, increasingly the political leverage that the EU has over the conflict has evaporated and I think today we have to recognise, despite all the good work the EU has done, it's basically failed to advance any of its m minimal objectives in Syria. It looks very absent from the diplomatic game today. The international players in Syria um, do not include the EU amongst, amongst them. Uh, and it's difficult to see how that's going to be reversed in, in the near term. At, at the conference, the EU leaders are talking in familiar terms about the importance of a political, an inclusive political transition. But in the current circumstances where the regime seems to be really on the verge of achieving peace on its terms, it's difficult to, I think it'd be difficult to argue that that inclusive transition is on the verge of being achieved. And it's not clear to me that the EU has a much idea how to um, exert meaningful political leverage to make that happen, however admirable its overall objectives are. If you talk to members of the Syrian opposition, they feel very disappointed and a little bit betrayed by the EU. Uh, that's their perception, of course, that the European governments rather encourage them to, to rise up and to push for more political freedom. And then the Western powers didn't f f follow through with the support that would have enabled them to actually achieve their objectives. So they, you know, I mean, their argument would be that European governments, perhaps unwittingly, were guilty of leaving them very vulnerable, that they were incited to rise up and then uh, left at the, at the mercy of the regime without significant, and in particular, of course, military assistance from Western powers. That's not to say that military intervention would have been easy or would have solved the crisis. It could easily have inflamed things and, and made the conflict uh, worse. But I think it would be difficult to disagree with opposition leaders in Syria who express this feeling of, of disappointment and betrayal. So in Carnegie, for a number of years, we've been monitoring these kinds of protests ar around the world, and it's really very, very interesting. It, it, it is a global trend um, that exists in all regions of the world today, and it's becoming a more significant element of global politics. So what's happening in Algeria 
at this very moment fits this pattern perfectly. Of course, many people would say it's kind of Algeria catching up with the protests that happened in other Arab states uh, some years ago. But of course, also it's a global trend, but each state has its own specificities as well. And we, we know that the structure of the Al Algerian regime is very specific, is very unique. And that, of course, will condition that the, the way this uh, protest movement plays out in Algeria. Um, but the, the protests there do share many characteristics with those we've seen in other countries. Quite a wide range of society participating, some very political, some not very politically engaged, civil society, human rights organisations, uh, different ideological persuasions as, as well. What we learn, what we learn from the experience in other countries is that in the short term these protests can force regimes to make concessions as exactly as we've seen in Algeria, the problem can come up rather over the medium and, and longer term when you have the challenge of keeping this momentum going, when regimes can quite cleverly make some concessions but in a way that actually enables them to consolidate better their, their own power. Um, and, it, and in that next phase we will see that um, the situation in Algeria could become much more challenging. I, mean, I think it's a well-known fact that the EU role, and of course particularly the, the French role, needs to be very, very cautious and nuanced. Uh, outsiders are not going to determine the way that this plays out. I mean, in a way, the, the domestic actors, the civic actors in Algeria need to be given the space to um, e express their desires and to negotiate with the regime. So outside involvement can easily backfire. Uh, but, but simply to stand back and do nothing and to simply uh, support the regime against these kinds of movements also loads the dice against what could be a, an interesting potential opportunity for change in Algeria. So policymakers will need to walk this tightrope between, between doing too much and, and, and not doing enough. So of course the relationship with Algeria has been a bit more distant than with countries like Tunisia or Morocco. Algeria doesn't need the money or even perhaps the trade as, as much, so the EU's leverage is a lot less. Um, uh, it's, it's weaker in Algeria than it is in some other countries. So again, I don't think the international community will determine the outcome, nor should it try to. Um, but it, shouldn't, it should try to avoid uh, making it more difficult for pro-democratic voices in Algeria to achieve at least a modicum of reform in the country. Um, and arguably if the EU doesn't kind of broaden out its policy a, a little bit towards the country, it could, as in other countries that we've just been talking about, in the longer term, be accused of um, having sided with the regime at a moment when things when there could have been a breakthrough in the country.